Hello, everybody. After the last lecture we had together, which was rather abstract and needed more thinking than uh, facts, today we're going to talk much more factually and we're going to talk about many more details um, that hopefully can be imagined or seen. Today we're going to talk about mitochondria, about their structure, about the specifics. We're going to go into quite a bit more detail than you've heard previously. Towards the end of the lecture, we're also going to talk about some diseases that are related to dysfunction of mitochondria, mostly genetically determined, uh, to show you how the knowledge about mitochondria is important for medicine. Uh, but of course, all of you have already heard about mitochondria actually quite a bit. So what do you know about mitochondria? What are they? What do they do? Powerhouse, <laughs> Powerhouse of the cell, okay. <laughs> the usual way of putting it. Um, and we're gonna talk many, much more about it in the, in the next lecture, what, what it actually means. But okay, it produces quite a bit of, in most cells, it produces most of ATP, okay, under normal conditions, okay. So powerhouse of the, uh, of the cell. What else do you know? It's bean shaped, okay. We'll, we'll talk about the shape in a second, okay. Huh? It's, sorry, I, can't, I just can't hear you. Okay, it is a membrane bound organelle and not just membrane bound, but it actually has two membranes, okay. Yeah, oh, sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear that, but okay. So it has two membranes, which is quite unusual because there aren't actually that many organelles that have two membranes. Do you know any other organelle that has two membranes? Okay, chloroplasts, yeah, there is, it's a bit more complicated with chloroplasts, but okay, they have two membranes and, and the nucleus, okay? The nucleus also has two membranes, although there are actually some differences between, as we'll see in a second, between the, uh, the types of membranes. Okay, what else do we know about mitochondria? It has its own DNA. It has its own DNA, very good, yeah. Again, something that we are going to discuss uh, today as well. Can it produce its own proteins? Okay, it can produce its own protein, so it has its own proteosynthetic apparatus. Okay, again, something we're gonna discuss, yeah. Likely originated by endosymbiotic theory. Okay, the most likely hypothesis, the most Accepted hypothesis at the moment of the origin of mitochondria is what's called endosymbiotic uh, theory. And again, something we're going to talk about today as well in quite a bit more detail. All right, so, you know, you already know quite a bit about mitochondria and today's lecture should really uh, put a little bit more detail into your knowledge, hopefully connect some bits together and also show why it's important for, uh, for medicine to understand mitochondria. All right, well, uh, to start with, let's have a look at what mitochondria actually look like, okay? So there was the idea that they are bean shaped. Nope. Mm. Sorry. It's not ideally visible. I don't know which one's these though, no. Go. Okay, it's not ideal visible, but hopefully you should be able to see a little bit there. Uh, it's actually nicer monitor. Um, okay, maybe I'm not supposed to be moving these things around. Right. Okay, so it's either that or that, I imagine, I don't know. Um, so this is what mitochondria actually look like when we look at them under microscope. This is a, uh, a cell derived from a mouse. It's a murine cell. Uh, it's, uh, the type of the cell is a myoblast, so it's basically immature muscle cell. And these cells, if we let them, if we change the conditions a little bit, so this is a cultured cell, we grow it in, in our lab. But if we change the conditions a little bit, they would start fusing together and they will form a muscle fiber, okay? But this is immature cell, not yet into a muscle fiber. And what we did here, we stained specifically the mitochondria. So there are stains, there are uh, dyes 
that accumulate specifically in mitochondria because of their membrane potential, something that we're going to talk about in the next lecture. Um, and this is what it looks like when we put it under a, an under a fluorescent microscope. Okay, so it's a dye which fluoresces. When we shine light on it, it gives off a different wavelength of, of light. Um, and here you can see the shapes of mitochondria. This is actually a picture from a confocal microscope. It's not a normal fluorescent microscope, but something called confocal microscope, which basically uses laser uh, to scan the cell, and it allows us to only select one plane inside the cell. Okay, so what we see here is basically a cross-section of the cell. Okay, so we're not looking at the whole thick cell. Okay, when I say thick, we're talking about 10 micrometers or something like that. Uh, but here we actually cut through the cell, and that's why the picture, not for you now, but it's actually fairly brilliant. I mean, we can very clearly see the details. Okay, if it was a normal fluorescent microscope, it rolls some together and it just wouldn't be, it would be a bit hazy. Okay, here it's very clear. Again, you can't see it, but it's fairly clear. You can see it on the, on the monitor afterwards if you want. So this is sort of an answer to uh, the suggestion that they are being shaped. Well, are they really? Um, some of them might be, okay? You can see little granules there which could potentially be construed as being bean shaped. But here in the cell, you can actually see that the mitochondria are forming these long filaments. And if we use an even better confocal microscope, we would see that these filaments are interconnected. So they form something that's called a reticulum. Reticulum meaning a network, okay, reticulum, network, um, of interconnected mitochondria. And this is something that's quite interesting about mitochondria, that they can, in certain, under certain conditions, exist as individual, let's say, bean-shaped or spherical or whatever little organelles. But in most functioning cells, they are actually connected together to form these filamentous uh, networks. Okay? This is fairly important for the function as well, because this allows the individual mitochondria, which almost never are individual, to communicate with each other, to exchange DNA, to exchange information, to exchange um, uh, interme metabolic intermediates, etc. Okay? So this is a very typical picture of mitochondria in a cell. Okay? There are conditions when they look different, but this, this, is, this is mostly what it looks like. So when you see a cross-section of a mitochondrion, it's probably better to think about it as, as if we took one of those long filaments and just cut through them. Okay? So it's usually not so much a bean-shaped thing, but it's, it, it looks more like this. Now, when we actually take the cro cross-section and look at it under an electron microscope, so here we are at a much, much smaller uh, scale. So this is what a cross-section of a mitochondrion from a cardiac muscle, from the heart, look li looks like. And as you can see, there are these typical internal uh, structures inside the mitochondrion, which are called cristae. And cristae are composed of the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is folded very neatly into these, uh, into these shapes. I'm showing you this picture, and maybe you've seen that before, uh, to once again kind of uh, distinguish between what is usually drawn and what it actually looks like. So the usual drawing of a mitochondrion, and again, that's something that I use as well, is this would be the outer membrane, and then you have something like this as the inner membrane. Okay? This is usually not what the mitochondrion looks like. Okay? It can happen, it's usually in cells that are dying or they're not using their mitochondria at all, it might look something like this. But the majority of functioning mitochondria are completely filled with the cristae, okay? So there's actually very little of the space, both inside the mitochondria and between the membranes, we'll talk about it in a second, and most of it is just filled with, with the cristae. Why? Because in the cristae, there are actually some of the most important metabolic pathways um, in, in our body, and one of them is the respiratory chain, and that's something we're going to talk in the, in the next lecture. Okay, so we basically, we're trying by putting the cristae in to put in as many enzymes as we can because they are inside, uh, inside the membrane. This is a 3D reconstruction of the electronogram, well, not that one, but another one. Um, so here you can see in 3D how the space inside the mitochondria is basically filled with, uh, with the cristae. Um, on your right, 
this is just like picking out the different shapes of cristae. So this is not an empty mitochondrion, okay? It's not empty. It's just they only picked out a few different uh, shapes of the cristae. So don't worry about that too much. But on, on your left, this is what, the, what many mitochondria in really highly functioning cells uh, will look like inside, okay? So it's all cristae, basically. All right. Um, so we started talking about the membranes, okay? And the membranes... Uh, do really make mito mitochondria stand out. Yeah, I'll switch the lights on uh, so that you can see. Right. So we have the outer membrane and we have the inner membrane. There are actually many similarities and differences between these two membranes and similarities and differences between these membranes and other membranes in the cell. So what are biological membranes composed of? What are they made of? Okay, proteins phospholipids. and phospholipids. Okay, proteins, phospholipids, and yeah, are there other things? There are proteins, glycoproteins are proteins, proteins, phospholipids, cholesterol. and cholesterol. All right, okay, typical components of a, of, of a cellular membrane, okay, any kind of biological membrane. All right, what is usually, and if you don't know that, just guess, what, is, what do you think is the ratio between proteins and phospholipids in, let's say, the plasma membrane? Okay, it's about 50-50, excellent. Okay, how do you know that? Are you just reading off some, okay? Sorry? Wikipedia, okay, all right, okay. Um, so yeah, in, in the plasma membrane, it's approximately 50% protein and 50% phospholipid. Uh, this is just to kind of, uh, you know, this is just to stress that it's not just phospholipids. Usually when you see a drawing of a membrane, it looks like it's mostly phospholipids and then from time to time there's a protein there, okay? In most membranes, that's not the case. Usually there's at least 50% or so of proteins in there. Do you want to ask something? Uh, no, there is the cholesterol in the creation. Where, where the phospholipid, uh, where the where cholesterol is? Well, it's basically interspersed between the phospholipid molecules, okay? Now, the outer mitochondrial membrane is when we take the ratio between proteins and phospholipids uh, in, into account, looks very similar to the plasma membrane. So it has approximately 50% protein, approximately 50% phospholipids. But what is interesting is that it doesn't contain any cholesterol, okay? There's virtually no cholesterol. There might be a few molecules here and there, but there's virtually no cholesterol there. Okay, so that makes it stand out. The other interesting thing about the outer mitochondrial membrane is that it's very permeable to all sorts of chemicals. It contains protein channels, which are called, which are called porins. Can you see that? Can you read that? No? Porins. As the name suggests, they form pores in the membrane. And these porins form channels which are relatively non-selective. So they allow all sorts of different chemicals to go in and out, okay? So the outer membrane is very permeable to almost everything. The inner membrane, on the other hand, so if we look at the two membranes together. The inner membrane is still very different from the outer membrane. It also doesn't contain any cholesterol, okay, so that is a similarity, but it contains many more proteins than the outer membrane or any other uh, biological membrane. So it contains something between 75 to 80 percent proteins, okay? So once again, the usual thing, well, membranes are composed of phospholipids, well, yes they are, but here almost 80 percent of the membrane are actually proteins. And those are the proteins we're going to be talking about in the next lecture, the, the respiratory chain and, uh, and others. The other important difference of the inner mitochondrial membrane is that it is from the outer, is that it's very poorly permeable to almost everything, okay? So while the outer membrane allows anything to go in and out, pretty much, okay? The inner membrane only allows certain chemicals to go in and out. There, there need to be, so unlike the porins, which allow anything, here in the inner membrane, we need to have specific transporters 
four specific chemicals, and those are the only ones that can traverse the inner mitochondrial membrane. So if there is no specific transporter, the chemical will stay either inside or outside, and it will not be able to go through the membrane. Okay? So the inner membrane is very impermeable. There are approximately 50 different transporters in the inner mitochondrial membrane for 50 different chemicals, and that's it. Nothing else gets in or out. Okay? So for anything that we need to transport across the membrane, across the inner mitochondrial membrane, we need a specific transporter. And you'll hear about some of these transporters as we talk about some of the metabolic, uh, some of the metabolic pathways. Okay? So the inner membrane, very tightly folded into Criste, uh, has only 50, approximately 50 specific transporters, contains no cholesterol, and is very impermeable to most things. Right? So that's, that's a big difference between them. Sorry? Say again? No cholesterol. No, no cholesterol. So these two, these two membranes obviously also form spaces between them and inside them. Okay? So they also delimit certain spaces. So if this is the mitochondrion, what is, what is this space? It's the cytosol. Okay, easy. What is this space? It's the intermembrane space. And then we have the space here is the matrix. Now, here when I drew the criste, normally they would be actually even closer together. So you can see that both the intermembrane space and the, and the matrix, actually there, there aren't a lot of them. You can see that on, on, on this picture. Okay? The spaces are actually much smaller, than, uh, much smaller than they are usually thought to be. Now, the majority of the intermembrane space is actually inside the criste. Okay? So this is the majority of the intermembrane space. Here this space, which normally we would, you know, when you think intermembrane space, you usually think about this space, but that's actually very, very, very small. The, the, the distance between the two membranes in most, in most places is about 20 nanometers. Okay? So if you compare that to the thickness of the membrane, what is the usual thickness of a membrane, approximately? Okay, seven, eight nanometers, six, okay, something like that. Let's say seven as a, as a middle value, okay? So it's only, this whole space is only about three times as thick as the membrane itself, okay? So there's very, very little space there at all, okay? And in fact, this space is so small because for a lot of stuff that needs to go in and out of the mitochondrion, it's quite important for the two membranes to be very close to each other. Okay? When we talk about proteins in the mitochondrion, you'll see why, why that is so important. Okay? So this space is very tiny and there's, all, there's virtually none there. So the majority of the intermembrane space, and when we talk about the function of mitochondrion and the respiratory chain, it basically all happens inside the criste. Okay? That's where the real intermembrane space is. Does it make sense? Sort of? Yeah, maybe. All right. In the folding of Criste, a lot of different proteins take, uh, take part. So it's not just that they fold by themselves. We need a lot of proteins to actually make that shape. Okay? One of these proteins that actually make this tight fold is ATP synthase, and that's something we're going to talk about in the, in the next lecture. So ATP synthase, which looks something like this, is actually very important for folding for creating this tight fold, but we'll, we'll talk about ATP synthase later. But there's an additional new component, which is only in the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is a special phospholipid called cardiolipin, which is apparently very important for having these tightly folded cristae, because other membranes cannot fold so neatly, and it's clear that cardiolipin plays an important role. What is, because you've already heard about cardiolipin, what, what, why is it different? No, how, is it, how is it different from other, other phospholipids? It's like two phospholipids connected together. It's it looks like two phospholipids connected together. So what is it composed of? Okay, this is a revision of phospholipids or lipids. What is it made of? Acid. Okay, so it's made of phosphatidic acid. What is phosphatidic acid? Sorry? <laughs> Say again? Two 
very good. Okay, so phosphatidic acid is glycerol, esterified with two fatty acids, okay? And then the third position is esterified with phosphoric acid. This is phosphatidic acid. This is the basis of all phospholipids, of all glycerophospholipids. A very important molecule, and we, we very much expect you to know this, okay? That this is phosphatidic acid. All right, so this is phosphatidic acid, and in a normal, normal glycerophospholipid, something would be attached to the, to the, uh, to the phosphate. What would it be? Or what could it be? Okay, it would be choline, serine, sorry? It could in theory. Ethanolamine, okay, inositol, which is basically a sugar derivative, okay, inositol, etc., etc. okay? Is this something you know? If not, this is something you definitely should know, all right? Okay, in cardiolipin, it's different. In cardiolipin, we take two phosphatidic acids and we connect them together using glycerol. Like so. Okay, so cardiolipin is really a double phospholipid in a way. Okay, two phospholipids, two phosphatidic acids bound together using cholesterol. And it's probably important because it has kind of two connected phospholipid groups, and these probably help these, you know, folds to form, okay, most likely. So cardiolipin actually um, uh, is about 20% of the composition of the inner mitochondrial membrane, and it's not really found anywhere else. Hence also the name cardiolipin, because it was first isolated from cardiac muscle, which contains a lot of mitochondria. They didn't know it then that it, that it comes from mitochondria, so they call it cardiolipin. It's specific to the heart, but it's not specific to the heart. It's actually in all, in all tissues, in all inner membranes of mitochondria, okay? It's just that cardiac muscle contains a lot of mitochondria, and that's why they found it there. Yeah? Uh, this cardiolipin molecule, you said it's important in the folding. Is it because it would be found on, if it stays like this, like one portion would be on this side and one portion would be on this side? No, 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 no. It basically just makes it easier to bend the membrane in, in a relatively small angle there, or small radius rather, okay? You can read about it more, but, but it basically, it allows this geometry of this like curving it very, very tightly, okay? Yes? It's composed of two phosphatidic acids connected through cholesterol, uh, uh, through glycerol, sorry, not cholesterol. Should be there another oxygen between the Of course. And here it should be carbonyl. I'm leaving out a lot of the details because I assume that, of course, you know them, okay? So I'm not drawing them, but of course, there are lots of things missing, okay? But, but, but you should already know the structure. It shouldn't really be uh, new to you. All right, so cardiolipin, about 20% of the inner membrane, but not really found anywhere else. Okay. Now, the, if we go from the cytosol through the intermembrane space into the matrix, the matrix could be imagined as a cytosol of the, cyt of the mitochondrion, right? It sort of is the cytosol, the inside of the mitochondria. Well, similar to the cytosol, it's not really a an easy aqueous solution like you would have in a test tube, okay? When we're, doing the, when we're doing the practicals, you have a solution in a test tube, there's a little bit of stuff in it, and you measure the amounts or something. Neither the cytosol nor the matrix are just a normal solution of stuff. Why? The concentration of proteins in the matrix is extremely high. It's about 50%, okay? So, the concentration of proteins is about 500 grams per liter inside the matrix. Could somebody think why, why I think that's very high? Sorry, can you just ask that? Like, 
um, I think that 500 grams per liter is a very high concentration. Could somebody give an illustration why I think that it's a very high concentration? It is half the solution, <laughs> that's very true. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, for example, okay, so if you try to make coffee that where half of the stuff will be, it will be very thick, you know, not really a solution, but this very thick substance that you wouldn't be able even to drink, okay? The other possible illustration is, imagine that you put, that you make a 50% solution of sugar, okay? Sugar is very water soluble, it's very easy to dissolve, but imagine that you put into um, 100 milliliters, you put 50 grams of sugar. You would get a very thick syrup that even would be difficult to pour, okay? Let alone to have anything happening in it. So, it's important to realize that both the matrix and the cytosol are actually kind of gel-like substances. They're not a solution where anything can move from anywhere very quickly, okay? So thick gels, okay, where in order to transport anything from place to place, we have to have very clever mechanisms for it to happen. So this is just for you to realize that when we talk in biochemistry about, okay, this intermediate is produced here and then it goes to somewhere else. Well, usually it just doesn't go by itself, okay? In most cases, the, in, the intermediates and the, the various metabolites are not even transported because most metabolic pathways in our cell are organized in such a way that all the enzymes are very close to each other, okay? They, they, they assemble together. So, for example, glycolysis, it's not like uh, the first uh, the first step of glycolysis happens here in the cell and then the metabolite diffuses to a different place and there is another enzyme. No, all the enzymes are very, very close to each other so that we can avoid this diffusion which would just take forever, okay? In this thick gel, it would take days or maybe years, okay, for it to actually, uh, that's just testing the, the sirens, okay? Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, so, so the concentration of proteins inside the matrix and inside the cytosol is very high, and the whole cell is very tightly organized in order to be able to transport things around, because by diffusion, basically nothing would happen. Yep. Is that what you call a multi-enzyme complex? A multi-enzyme complex is the usual meaning of that, are, are bits that are actually like directly, so they form one protein complex, okay? But what I'm talking about here is more, is this usually called super complexes. So you have already complexes of subunits, and these actually are, are very close to each other so that they, they work cooperatively. So, so it's a, an, an even higher level of organization, basically. Okay? Yep? Uh, this super complex, is that uh, how uh, it works with glycolysis as well? It does, yes. Uh, when you talk about glycolysis, nobody tells you that, okay? You go through all the steps and it looks like they're independent uh, proteins. Well, they are independent proteins, but in the cell, they're all bunched very, very closely together. Otherwise, they wouldn't work properly. Okay? And this is true for most things that occur in the cell. Signaling, everything, it all happens very, in very, very small spaces because, again, moving anything through a gel of 50 grams of protein per, uh, per 100 milliliters is just impossible. Very, very difficult. We're going to discuss it a little bit more when we talk about muscles, how ATP actually gets from mitochondria to where it's needed. Well, it can't really. There is actually a very clever thing how to do it because ATP just wouldn't be able to diffuse at all. All right? Good. So we already started talking about uh, proteins inside the matrix. And that brings us to what we already discussed in the beginning, and that's the idea of the mitochondrion have it, having its own DNA and producing its own proteins. Now, the mitochondrion indeed has its own DNA, and you've heard already that this DNA is different from the DNA in the nucleus. It's circular, okay? So it is a circular chromosome, just one circular thing, all right, circular. What else is different? Sorry? It comes from the mother. It is inherited through the mother. We'll mention that towards the end of the lecture. Yeah? Sorry? There's It does. I'll, I'll explain what the genes are. Yeah. It's more prokaryotic. Okay, its structure is more prokaryotic, so there are no histones, for example. There are no nucleosomes, okay? 
it's, it's actually organized in a different way. There are some other types of proteins, so it's not completely naked. There are other proteins around it. But the typical organization of the nuclear chromosome, okay, in nucleosomes with histones, etc., is not present in the mitochondrion. Okay? So it looks more like bacterial DNA than it does as a eukaryotic DNA. Okay? It's not quite the same, but, 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 but there is a difference. All right. It's also very small. Okay? It's also very small. Mitochondrial DNA in a human cells has only 16 kilobases length. Okay? There are only 16,000 bases, and that's it. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny molecule of DNA. Okay? It codes for 37 genes. And out of that, only 13 are proteins. So it only codes for 13 proteins in total. In some literature, you find 14. I'll, I can explain it later why it might be 14, but let's talk about 13 proteins, okay? And that's it. Only 13 proteins of, out of all the proteins in the mitochondrion are actually encoded in the mitochondrial DNA and are actually produced by transcription and translation in the mitochondrion, okay? All the rest of the proteins, which means 99.99% or something like that, are produced in the cytoplasm from nuclear DNA and then they are imported into the mitochondrion. And when I said that there is a good reason why these two membranes are so close to each other, well, because for the import of those proteins, we need to have special importing machinery there, special proteins, which are called TIM and TOM. Okay, which means transporter of the outer membrane and transporter of the inner membrane. Okay, Tom Tim, Tim Tom. Okay, and these two very large protein complexes allow proteins from the cytoplasm, from the cytosol, to be imported into the uh, into the matrix or also into the intermembrane space, depending on where they are needed. Okay, and this is a very very complex uh, complex process. I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but they just, this just kind of highlights how close these two things have to be together in, uh, in order to cooperate the Tim Tom complex, all right? So the majority, 99.99 whatever pro percent of all the proteins inside the mitochondrion are not produced in the mitochondrion. Only 13 proteins are, okay? All these 13 proteins, all these 13 polypeptide chains are part of the respiratory chain and ATP synthase. Not all of it. The majority of complexes, well, actually all the complexes of the respiratory chain are much, much bigger. Only a few subunits are encoded in the mitochondrion. The rest of it, even for the respiratory chain, even for the ATP synthase, actually has to come from the nucleus. Okay? So almost all the proteins in the, in the mitochondrion are from the nucleus. Only 13 polypeptides are there. What is this 14? Uh, recently, it was discovered that one of the genes in mitochondrial DNA can be frame-shifted and transcribed and translated into a different protein, okay? And this new protein is called humanin, and it's added like the 14th polypeptide chain. But it's just a different reading of a gene which is for something else, okay? So let's not worry about it too much, all right? Now, there are 37 genes, but only 13 polypeptide chains. So what are the other genes for? RRNA, so there are two RRNAs, okay, and 22 tRNAs, okay, and that puts the number together, okay? So 22 tRNAs, two RRNAs, and, and 13 polypeptide chains. There aren't any introns? There are no introns, there are no introns, okay? So that also makes it closer to bacterial, uh, bacterial DNA. Can you please repeat about the RNAs? About the RRNAs? So there are two rRNAs encoded and 22 tRNAs, okay? In addition to, D to its own DNA, mitochondria also obviously have their own ribosomes, okay? Which are different from the ribosomes in the, uh, in the cytoplasm, okay? So there, there are different ribosomes. They are kind of similar to bacterial ribosomes, but they're not exactly the same, okay? So they're close, close to bacterial, but not quite. 
So they have their own ribosomes, and that which allows them obviously to produce these proteins uh, within the um, within the mitochondrion itself. All right. Um, okay. Do you have any questions about this bit? About what mitochondria are actually made of, what they all contain, how they differ, how their structures differ. Hmm? About the common thing, how is the mechanism if you work? The mechanism is such that basically inside the huge protein complex, the protein that comes from the cytoplasm is unfolded, then it's pushed through the membrane, and then it's refolded. And then it usually happens again and uses a lot of ATP and it's a very complex process. So, still, some parts of it are not entirely understood what, how it actually works, but it's basically unfolded and refolded. Is it kind of like a channel? Like, do they kind of fuse together to... Part of it is a channel, yes, but again, it's a massive, massive complex of proteins which each do something else with, with the protein. But yes, of course, there's a channel there as well. Yes? So crystal and tubular are just kind of ends of the range, okay? So this would be the crystal, lots of cristae, okay? So this would be the one end of the range, and the other end of the range would be something weird like this. Usually you find these tubular mitochondria in cells that are not really using much of the mitochondria, but this is just a morphological description and just ends of a spectrum. So mitochondria can be anywhere on the spectrum, okay? So they're not distinct types, okay? Here we have this and here we have that. It's just, if you have a lot of electronograms, some of them will look more tubular and some of them will look more crystal. Okay. Yep. Protein, are they or can the cell also produce them? These 13 proteins are only in the mitochondrial DNA and the cell cannot produce them anywhere else. Okay? So if they are damaged, and it's something we're going to talk about towards the end of the lecture, you have a problem. Okay? They are crucial parts of the electron transport chain. And actually, there are some theories about why it, they are still kept in the mitochondria, but we can discuss that after uh, a short break. Okay, so let's take a four minute break and we're going to continue after that. Let's continue. Do you have any questions about the first part of the lecture? Is it all clear? No? <laughs> Is it all clear? Yes. Okay, good. So in the beginning, when I was asking you about what are the things that you know about mitochondria, somebody, somebody suggested that their origin is through endosymbiosis, or that the theory of their origin is the endosymbiotic theory. So what is that? What does it mean, endosymbiotic? It supposes that there are separate prokaryotic organisms which merged with the cells and became Okay, basically that's true. So the theory posits, it states, that mitochondria and also chloroplasts originated as, as different, as distinct bacterial cells which fused probably with, an, with another bacterium and formed all the eukaryotic cells that we now have, okay? Now this theory was first developed in the end of the 19th century. <laughs> That's okay. Towards the end of the 19th century. And it was first formulated in the very beginning of the 20th century in 1905 by a Russian biologist called Konstantin Mereshkovsky. So Konstantin Mereshkovsky was the first one to say, here I think that these organelles, and he was only talking about chloroplasts at the time, do you have any question? Okay. It's good that you all think that I'm looking at you, but uh, anyway, okay. You, you looked a little puzzled and it looked like you might have a question, but maybe not. All right. So Konstantin Mereshkovsky said in 1905, he published a paper where he suggested that chloroplasts used to be bacteria, that they used to be photosynthesizing bacteria that were engulfed by some long time ago by some precursor of a plant cell and that they are still kind of semi-independent. The reason for this idea probably was that when you look under a microscope, 
the, the chloroplasts, first of all, they look like small green bacteria, okay? And also they're moving around the cell, okay? In fact, I only showed you a still photo of the mitochondria, but we also have movies of it. And even mitochondria inside the cell are moving around constantly, okay? So when you look under a microscope and you see these little moving green dots, he was like, well, they look like mitochondria and probably they even used to be, uh, used to be bacteria. He had no really proof for that at the moment, but he suggested that. What was quite interesting, or what is quite interesting, is that towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there was still a big discussion about Darwinism, about the evolutionary theory. Um, now, Darwin posited that evolution, that the development of organisms, was based on competition. There was competition that actually caused organisms to evolve, okay? It was the survival of the fittest, who won in the competition survived, who, who lost in the competition didn't survive, okay, died out. Okay, that's the idea of Darwinism. But against Darwinism, there have always been scientists who suggested that actually in nature we can see a lot of cooperation, symbiosis, working together, collaboration, and that this is also important for, um, for the development of organisms and for the de development of the biosphere. One of the main proponents, or probably the best known proponents, of this cooperative theory of biology was Peter Kropotkin, another Russian, he was a geologist actually, but, but he was a very famous, uh, famous scientist, and he was also one of the founders, one of the biggest theorists of the anarchist movement, okay, in the, in the, in the 19th century. And that's quite interesting because he said, well, no, actually when I look into uh, into nature, and also when I look into the human society, it's not really all about competition. What actually makes us work well is when we work together, and it's the same thing in nature. And he described in his books many cases from the natural world where different organisms were collaborating, and that actually made them stronger and helped them survive whatever changes or whatever challenges that they saw. So we had Darwinism saying everybody eats everybody and you know who eats everybody survives. And then there's Kropotkin suggesting the symbiosis. So uh, Merezhkovsky's theory of symbiosis actually comes from this idea that organisms actually can collaborate, even though we could also argue that the origin of chloroplasts could have been that just like one cell ate some other cells and, and, you know, and then survived because of that, but whatever. The interesting thing is that Merezhkovsky himself was uh, what probably today we would describe a proto-fascist, he worked with the Tsarist secret police and, and, and he was probably not a very nice person uh, to be around at all. Um, so it's kind of interesting that politics not, not always works with the, with the ideas that, that, that people have. Anyway, this theory of endosymbiosis of chloroplasts was not, did not really get a lot of support. One of the reasons was that there were some people who suggested that you can actually take chloroplasts out of the cell and you can culture them separately. So they said, well, they are basically still bacteria. You can take them out and culture. We're still talking about like beginning of the 20th century, okay? But people very, very quickly find out that that's not true. You can't culture them, okay? Chloroplasts will not live outside of the, of the cell. They just can't do that, okay? And we'll see with mitochondria why that is so. Um, so this theory basically disappeared. But then in the, the 1960s, in 1966, an American uh, biologist, theoretical biologist, but yeah, um, called Lynn Margulis, or at the, time, at the same time her name was Lynn Sagan because she was married to Carl Sagan. Some of you may have heard, a very, very famous astronomer and popular, he, he made a lot of films and et cetera. So yeah, so she was then married to him, but that's not really that important, so Lynn, Margulis, or Sagan, published a paper in 1966 suggesting that not only chloroplasts, but also mitochondria originated from bacteria. Why would you think that? Well, there are a lot of similarities between chloroplasts and mitochondria, okay, two membranes, their own DNA, etc. Okay, and based on these ideas, based on these structural compositional bits, she suggested that both mitochondria and chloroplasts originally were individual, uh, individual bacteria, which were probably engulfed by some proto-eukaryotic cell, okay, some precursor of eukaryotic cell, and they started working together. Okay? Or first they lived together, and then they started engulfing each other. All right? that, that was the idea of Lim Margulis. Now, nobody believed it. 
Okay, people didn't like this idea, uh, partly maybe because she was a woman, so you know they were like, oh, yeah, whatever she's saying. Um, but over time, more and more people started thinking that actually there's something real behind it, um, and more and more. Um, Supporting evidence was discovered, especially with the advent of molecular biological methods, uh, sequencing of DNA and figuring out the, the differences and similarities between the DNA of mitochondria, the DNA of the nucleus, and the DNA of various bacteria. So more and more evidence started coming in towards the end of the 70s and then 80s of, in the last century. And nowadays, it is generally accepted that indeed mitochondria and chloroplasts originally were bacteria and they still carry some of the characteristics of these original, um, uh, original organisms. One of the main arguments against this symbiotic theory was for a long time the explanation that Lim Margulis brought forward for, the, for why, why would these two organisms start living together. And she said, well, mitochondria, or the bacterium from which mitochondria developed, was helpful for the host organism, for this proto-eukaryotic cell or whatever, because it used oxygen and it produced ATP, right? It brought in oxygen, used it for its metabolic pur purposes and produced ATP. And the host cell, the proto-eukaryotic cell, was using this ATP and of course that's a nice thing, right? To have free ATP. So that was our explanation for why this symbiosis actually occurred originally. However, there are two big problems with this explanation. One is that when the fusion occurred, whatever, three billion years ago, there was virtually no oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay? So it couldn't have been because of oxygen, because there was no oxygen then. Okay? Oxygen in the atmosphere is a much later development, basically with photosynthesizing bacteria, much, much later than when, the, when this fusion occurred. So it's very unlikely that it was because of oxygen. The other problem with the theory was that no organism, no known organism on the planet produces excess of ATP and just kind of exports it out of the cell. It doesn't happen, okay? Most organisms just produce enough ATP that they need and they certainly do not just like let it go somewhere, okay? So the idea that there would be this bacterium which would be using oxygen and sending its ATP out is just nonsense, okay? It's just not possible for something like that to exist. So these arguments against this theory actually kept the, the theory of endos, endosymbiosis from being accepted, even though more and more evidence from molecular biological methods, etc., was coming in. Nowadays, we have an alternative uh, theory of how this symbiosis actually, uh, actually came about. So nowadays, the most accepted hypothesis of theory is that the original host cell, okay, first of all, for a very long time it was thought that there was first a eukaryotic cell and that engulfed the future mitochondrion. Nowadays, virtually, well, very few people believe that. It's still possible, but now it's thought that actually it was the fusion event where the two bacteria fused which formed the first eukaryotic cell. Okay, so it was not a eukaryotic cell just taking a mitochondrion in, but the fusion itself actually formed uh, was the beginning of, of the eukaryotic cell. In fact, all eukaryotic cells are descendants from this one fusion cell that formed three billion years ago. This fusion event never happened again, and if it happened, then the descendants died out. Okay? So everything from little worms to us to whatever, all the eukaryotic cells come from this one fusion cell, which is quite interesting. Okay? So all the mitochondria in the world in all the organisms are all descendant from, from the one mitochondria. Okay, quite interesting. So, what we think nowadays is the, is the reason why the two cells started co cooperating or living together and then they become engulfed, or one became engulfed with the other, was that the host cell, so the cell that now, let's say, is the nucleus, okay, and the rest of it, was an archibacterium. You, I, I think we probably talked about it in the lecture about the prokaryotic cells, is that we have two classes of bacteria, eubacteria and archibacteria. Yeah, all right? So the, the host cell was most likely an archibacterium, okay? They're very different, very, very different groups of bacteria. So what, the host cell was probably an archibacterium, which was autotrophic. 
which doesn't mean, what, what does it mean, autotrophic? Produces energy for itself, well. Okay, this one wasn't using light energy, but that's one possible way of doing it. Yes, it uses CO2 as a source of carbon and it synthesizes its own complex organic molecules, okay? Exactly, so it, from inorganic molecules it makes organic molecules. That means autotrophic, okay? It can use light or some other source of energy for that. And the opposite are heterotrophic organisms or cells or bacteria, which on the other hand use, sorry? They use big organic molecules and break them down and, and produce energy this way, okay? So the host cell was an archaebacterium which was autotrophic and used hydrogen as its source of energy and carbon dioxide, of course, as its source of carbon, okay? And that's, why it, uh, that's how it lived and just built its, its structure. Let's not go into details what kind of metabolic pathways it used, okay? It would be fairly complicated, but this is the assumption, okay? Now, the symbiotic bacterium, the one from which, in the end, mitochondria will develop, was a eubacterium. Which was heterotrophic, so it, used, it took organic substances. And as a waste product, it produced hydrogen. Okay, once again, bacteria like this and bacteria like this are still around. So we can actually see them in nature, okay? So they do exist, it's possible to have these kind of bacteria because they still exist nowadays. Now, you can already see that having these two bacteria next to each other actually kind of makes sense because by taking some organic material and maybe some hydrogen, there's more hydrogen produced, so this can be taken up by this cell and they will be actually working together relatively nicely, okay? Now imagine that these two bacteria living together were removed from the, from the environment where hydrogen is available. So for example, the source of hydrogen goes away, okay, whatever it may be. Maybe it's coming from the earth or whatever, or the bacterium itself is removed somewhere else or something. So these two cells are then taken into an environment where there's no more hydro hydrogen. So this cell would die. If it wasn't for this cell, which is still providing hydrogen. So that means that the two cells, if they want to survive, they have to keep together. Or rather, for this cell, this cell would be all right, okay? But this one would have a problem, so it needs to keep this other cell with it. And over time, it, come, it came to engulf this other cell and keep it inside it. So this is the most accepted, this hydrogen endosymbiotic theory for the beginning of mitochondria. Now you may ask, yeah, but nowadays mitochondria do nothing with hydrogen. Okay, well they do, but yeah, not, not on the first sight, okay? So what, how, how is that possible, what happened? Well, first of all, this original pre-mitochondrial eubacterium, it was probably capable of doing something with oxygen. As we said at the time, there just wasn't enough oxygen in the atmosphere, so it wasn't very important, and probably the pathways for using oxygen were there just to detoxify oxygen, okay? Oxygen is a very toxic, or before we developed ways of dealing with it, it was a toxic, toxic gas. So when there appeared some oxygen, most organisms wanted to just get rid of it, okay? Because it interfered with some enzyme reactions, etc. So this pre-mitochondrion probably was able to use, not, to use oxygen, but it wasn't probably using it very much, or we don't know, okay? Maybe it used it for something, but we don't quite know, all right? Uh, so, what mitochondria do now is they use oxygen and they produce ATP, which is not here. But in fact, in some organisms, they are bodies which look like mitochondria. They do have their own DNA. They, they almost look like mitochondria. But actually, they're producing hydrogen. And they are called hydrogenosomes. And when we, when we was found out that hydrogenosomes are basically mitochondria that were just kind of, they're different than mitochondria, they're still related to mitochondria, but they do other things, then this hypothesis gained a lot of support because it was clear 
that mitochondria or at least very similar bits uh, in some cells, in certain, uh, in, in, in certain, especially parasites, can produce hydrogen and you kind of click together. Does the hydrogen theory make sense to you? Do you have any questions? No, hydrogenosomes are organelles in eukaryotic cells, but mostly single cell parasites have them. Some single cell parasites have hydrogenosomes. But when we look at hydrogenosomes, I mean, they look nothing like mitochondria, okay, morphologically. But when we look inside them, they still have DNA, and this DNA is similar to the DNA of mitochondria. So the idea is that this original cell developed in some cells into mitochondria, in others into hydrogenosome, depending on what, what they needed, on what kind of condition they are. Actually, these parasites that have hydrogenosomes, they, they live in anaerobic conditions. They don't have oxygen. They live inside other animals, and they don't have an oxygen. So that's why probably they still have hydrogenosomes, okay? even though they, it's not clear what they're for. Why do these only happen once? Well, it may have happened many times, but imagine that these two cells are living together and then they are removed from the original environment, most of them are going to die because they can't keep together, okay? They're not clever cells that, you know, just talk to each other and say, let's stay together because it's good for us, okay? They're stupid bacteria, they can't do that. So probably, it, maybe it happened a million times, but only one time out of all of them, they actually survived and they managed to, you know, keep going forever. And, and give rise to all eukaryotic cells in, in, in that we can actually see now. Okay, so it probably happened many times, but only one of them survived. Uh, not that not that we know of. Maybe it does. We just you know we can't see all the bacteria in the world what they're doing. Yeah, maybe it does happen. Uh, but. Can we try to artificially induce this? Uh, yeah, there was a question that the Czech, Czech students have had as well. I I don't know. Uh, I think if we wanted to do like an experimental study of this, we would probably need, need like hundreds and th hundreds of thousands of years or something just to, to let the two cells work together and, and you know, so I, I don't think it can be done like at shorter uh, time scales, okay. Now, after these cells realized, but not really, that they need to be together, as I said, one of them, the host cell started to engulf probably the other cell and it became a mitochondrion. But what is interesting is that the majority of the DNA of the genes of the original pre-mitochondrion were over time transferred into the nucleus, so into the host cell in a way. Does that make sense? So that's why, if you remember, we only have 13 proteins, only 37 genes in the mitochondrial DNA. But previously, it was a full bacterium. It had all the different metabolic pathways and everything in it. But these genes, over time, were transferred into the nucleus. So what is quite interesting, and you can sort of figure it out from what I said, but maybe not super easily, a lot of the pathways, metabolic pathways, that you're going to be talking about, or that we're going to be talking about in the next lectures, even though they're not happening in mitochondria, they are probably of mitochondrial origin. So for example, glycolysis, which occurs in the cytosol, was probably a pathway that brought this bacterium. It makes sense because the original host cell was autotrophic. It wouldn't need to break down glucose, okay? Well, this cell was heterotrophic. It needed to break down glucose or something else. Maybe it wasn't glucose, okay? So glycolysis actually originally was here but over time it was transferred to the nucleus and now it doesn't even occur in the mitochondrion. Only a very small subset of metabolic pathways remained in the mitochondrion from the original bacterium. Okay, and that's why we need to import a lot of proteins in, into the mitochondria and do a lot of complicated stuff because it's no longer actually inside there. Okay, there might be some reasons for it, why it's better to have it in the nucleus, I don't know, recombination, what have you. All right. Does the endosymbiotic theory make sense? Okay, any more questions to that? Well, we, we don't know. I mean, there is, and you've probably heard of that in the lecture about prokaryotic cells, there is a horizontal gene transfer. So bacteria between them can actually exchange DNA. 
Okay? And it's probably something like this may have been happening, and then it just got into the nucleus and stayed there, and then it kept being copied. We don't know. We don't know when the gene transfer occurred, whether it was before the fusion, after the fusion. But you would think that actually the transfer of genes should be easier once the cell is inside the other cell than harder. Okay, so we have no idea how that actually happened. Okay, but it's very likely that it was some kind of a mechanism that even now bacteria are used to exchange DNA, presumably. So as per this theory, uh, the two bacteria fused before the nucleus was really formed? Most likely. Yes, most likely nucleus formed after the two cells actually fused. Most likely. But again, there are people who disagree about that. Any more questions about endosymbiotic theory? No. So the last bit that I want to talk about is what it actually means, what all these things mean for medicine. Now, as we, in the next lecture and, f and future lectures, when we talk about all the metabolic pathways that occur in the mitochondria, it's very clear Therefore, normally functioning cells, we need to have normally functioning mitochondria, okay? Of course, there are cells that don't use a lot of mitochondria, only use them for some things, but we need mitochondria to produce lots of things, among others, ATP. Part of the interest of modern medicine in mitochondria nowadays is that cancer cells tend to have differently functioning mitochondria. This is something that was discovered in the 1920s by Otto Warburg, another German uh, chemist, I think it was a chemist, uh, when he discovered that cancer cells behave differently, that they have different metabolism, and at that time it was this idea, oh, now we know a difference between cancer cells and normal cells and we can start treating cancer. Well, that didn't quite materialize at that, at that time, but now, nowadays, we're coming back in research, we're coming back to mitochondria and studying the difference between cancer cells and normal cells, and hopefully there will be some treatment and there are some ideas already about that. But that's not what I want to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about cancer metabolism later on. What I wanted to talk about now is the inherited diseases which are caused by defects in the mitochondrial genome or in the mitochondrial function. So there are actually, there's a group of diseases called mitochondrial diseases which are caused by defects in, in mitochondrial function and they are, uh, most of them are inherited. Now you already mentioned that uh, the, uh, the mitochondrial DNA or mitochondria are only inherited from one parent, from the mother, okay? How does it work? Well, when the egg is fertilized by the sperm, okay, all the mitochondria are in the neck of the sperm, okay? And only, normally, only the head of the sperm gets into the, into the egg, okay? Furthermore, the egg, the oocyte, has very sophisticated mechanism that in case some mitochondria from the sperm get in, they are destroyed. Okay? So, no bacteria from the sperm get in, and if they do, they're destroyed. Yes? Is there any particular reason for that? There's probably some evolutionary reason for that, or maybe the, the, uh, the mitochondria and the sperm tend to be damaged, and therefore you don't want to allow them in, there are, probably, there are probably some reasons, but it's, it's not very clear why, why that is. What is quite interesting is that exactly a year ago, uh, there was a paper published uh, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which showed a family in China which, which had a biparental inheritance of mitochondria. So they actually inherited their mitochondria both from the mother and from the father. Um, and this was like a big thing because everybody was like, so what does it mean? Well, you know, are all our dogmas wrong that it's only inherited from the mother? Well, no, because this was a very specific family which had a genetic defect in this mechanism of destroying the mitochondria from the sperm, okay? So in the majority of people, no mitochondria from the sperm get in. But there is at least one family in China, and maybe there are others, uh, who have this defect, so, so some of the mitochondria can potentially get into the egg, and the offspring, the, the, chi the children, then have mitochondria from both parents, okay? This could have some implications for medicine and for other things, but so far, we only know about one, one family. Yeah, okay. So, mitochondria and mitochondrial DNA are inherited from the mother, and therefore mitochondrial diseases, at least some of them, are also inherited from the mother. 
if we spoke about mitochondrial diseases maybe 20 years ago, uh, well, we probably wouldn't be speaking about mitochondrial diseases, okay? Because they were known, but they were thought to be extremely rare, okay? Usually nobody knew about them, doctors couldn't recognize them, and they still can't, um, because it was thought that they are like one in a million or something, very, very rare thing, okay? Nowadays we know that mitochondrial diseases are actually relatively common. Um, their total frequency of all the different mitochondrial diseases is now estimated to be about one in 4,000. So it's still not like a flu, okay, that everybody has it. Um, but one in 4,000 for genetic disorder is actually pretty high frequency. Why was it that doctors, that medicine thought that it was rare? The problem is that mitochondrial diseases have very strange symptoms, okay? And the reason why they have very strange symptoms, and therefore it was very difficult to diagnose them, and a lot of them were probably not diagnosed at all because people had no idea what these bizarre things are. So the reason why there are strange uh, symptoms is, let's go back to the oocyte. So in the oocyte, in the egg, we have a lot of mitochondria. Lots and lots, thousands of mitochondria. Okay? Some of these mitochondria may have a mutation, they're not all the same. Like in our body, okay, even our somatic cells in the nucleus, some of them may have mutations and some might not, right? That's a normal thing. So some of these mitochondria may contain, mitochondria may contain mutated DNA, and other ones might have normal DNA. Now what happens when the cell starts dividing? Well, some of the daughter cells will have a high proportion of the damaged mitochondria, and some of the daughter cells will have a lower proportion of the damaged mitochondria. So depending on how these mitochondria are sorted into various organs and various tissues, and what the proportions between the normal and the abnormal mitochondria is, you will get different symptoms. So imagine that the majority of the damaged mitochondria, by random process, end up in the brain, you will have most symptoms in the brain. Then you might have mitochondria with the same mutation, but most of them get sorted into the muscles, and you will have most symptoms in the muscles. Also, there are other, pro other factors that play into what kind of symptoms you'll get, because tissues, for example, that need a lot of ATP, are gonna be much more sensitive to having damaged mitochondria. On the other hand, cell cells, on the other, on the other hand, cells that do not need that much ATP will not be that sensitive, and you might not see any damage even though they have damaged mitochondria. So if you combine all these th things together, it means that mitochondrial disease often are weird combination of weird symptoms. I'll tell you a few of them just to, just to get an idea, you don't need to remember, uh, but just to get an idea what kind of weird combination. So for example, one mitochondrial disease, one syndrome which is described, is the abbreviation, usually they have abbreviations because it's a collection of different symptoms. So one abbreviation is DAD. Yeah, DAD. Uh, DAD, which stands for diabetes and deafness. Okay, so these people have hearing loss and at the same time they have type one diabetes. Okay, you can see how weird it is for like normal medicine. How would these things be connected? Well, they are probably connected by the fact that both beta cells in the pancreas, which secrete insulin, and the hair cells in the inner ear have a very high need for ATP. Okay, maybe not all the time, but there are some peaks when they need a lot of ATP. So if you have a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA, which decreases the amount of ATP mitochondria can produce, you will get defects in these two cells, but not elsewhere, for example. Okay, so deafness and diabetes is one, one syndrome. The other one is, for example, called MELAS, which stands for mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. Okay? Just putting all the symptoms together and saying, well, it's the MELAS syndrome. Okay? Again, MELAS is connected, as DAD, is connected to mutations in mitochondrial DNA, actually many different mutations. So it's not a single gene disease or whatever, okay, there are many different mutations, which can give you the same or similar, let's say, uh, clinical picture, okay? Do I have any other interesting ones? Uh, this MELAS, yeah. Another one is, has abbreviation LHON, 
here the abbreviation is a little bit more logical. Uh, it's called Leber's Hereditary Optic Neuropathy. Okay, so Leber's is the guy who discovered it, and it's hereditary optic neuropathy, which means that the, the, the damaged part is the optic nerve, which degenerates over time. Okay, so the people become blind. Again, it's probably because there are more damaged mitochondria in the eyes, and at the same time, the, the nerve cells in the eyes require a lot of ATP at times, and therefore they start degenerating when they can't produce it. Okay? Now, I could just keep listing these symptom, these syndromes, there are so many of them, okay? And it's only in the past, let's say, 10 years that using molecular biological methods, we can start looking directly into the mutations. The trouble is, which makes it even more difficult to study, that there are mitochondrial diseases that are not caused by, by mutations in mitochondrial DNA, but they are caused by mutations in the nuclear DNA. Because as we said, 99.99% of all the proteins in mitochondria are actually from the nucleus, or are encoded in the nucleus, okay? So we can also have damaged mitochondria, not because of mitochondrial DNA damage, but because of nuclear, uh, nuclear DNA mutations. And of course here, the type of inheritance is gonna be different. It's gonna be probably Mendelian, okay, because it's in the, in the nucleus, it's not gonna be maternal. But at the same time, the symptoms might be a little bit bizarre as well, because it depends what the cells need. Uh, so one mitochondrial disease, which is almost always, not, not always, but almost always caused by mutations in, in nuclear DNA, is called Lay syndrome. Lay syndrome. Which again is a progressive encephalopathy, degeneration of the brain and of the spinal cord, and it's caused by mutations in nuclear DNA. In fact, it's usually caused by mutations in genes that are required for the correct assembly of the respiratory chain complexes, okay? So there are helper proteins in order to make stuff in mitochondria, and if they are damaged, you get damage to mitochondria and all these, these weird uh, symptoms. Yes? But they're not considered mitochondrial diseases. They are. All of these are mitochondrial diseases, but some of them are caused by, mostly by mutations in the mitochondrial DNA, and some of them mostly by mutations in nuclear DNA. But again, for many of these, you can find either. So there can be mutations in nuclear, but they're all caused by defect in mitochondrial function, and that's why they're called mitochondrial diseases. Yep? Mitochondrial diseases, are they more like, do they develop over like, age, or are they more present when you're playing? Like, Some of them, like Lay syndrome, occurs very early on, okay, and it's usually deadly within a few years after birth. Some other ones, like I think deafness and diabetes can develop into adulthood and just basically suddenly, suddenly develop, okay? Because it really depends on how stressed the cells are, how much ATP they need in various moments, how many stresses they go through before they start dying. Because you only see the symptoms when the cells start dying. And there are many factors that determine when that's going to happen. So in some people it can be relatively early on, in some people it can be very late. Yeah. I don't understand your question. Sorry. Oh, well, the sorting is random, uh, or mostly random. And these symptoms, well, they are random from the point of view of a clinician, okay? If you are a doctor for, with 40 years of experience, when you see a combination of deafness and diabetes, there's no obvious connection between the two, okay? If you have a heart disease and you start having swollen legs, yeah, there's an obvious connection between, okay? More fluid, blah, blah, blah. Here, what? So that, that's what I meant. Of course there's an explanation. They're not random, these symptoms. But from like traditional view of medicine, they are a bit random. Yes? So this random, I guess, sort of means that uh, the mother and the children don't have to have the same disease, right? Oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. The mother might not have any disease at all, yeah. Absolutely, because in her body, there may be just very, very few damaged mitochondria that do not really cause anything, but here, as the ratios change, it, it might happen. Yeah. Yes? No, I mean, in the, in the family uh, that was described in China, I don't think there were any symptoms related to that, and, and there shouldn't be any. I mean, there's no, reason why there would be 
bad, I guess, generally. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think there were any symptoms. Sorry? No, but you, you always get, as I said, you get a thousand or so mitochondria in the ovum. So if there's one or more additional, there might be just one. Yeah. But then they divide, the mitochondria divide, right? So again, they get sorted into various tissues and you may have some tissues where there's gonna be a high proportion of the, the, the mitochondria from the... Oh, absolutely. Well, surely in our body we have more than 1,000 mitochondria, right? Here we only have 1,000, but they have to divide so that every cell has got a few hundred. So they divide, the mitochondria divide themselves. They copy their, their mitochondrial DNA, et cetera. Yes? Yes. 16,000, but anyway, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yes, mitochondrial DNA is, mitochondrial DNA is different between different uh, individuals, S it, different enough that we can actually detect where the mitochondrial DNA came from. And this is something that is actually used in archeology span and paleontology and stuff like that to detect, um, to detect basically people's ancestries, where, where their mothers came from. Because we have different haplotypes in the world, there are about, I don't know how many, different so-called haplotypes, so types of mitochondrial DNA. And we can do the analysis, you can have your, your mitochondrial DNA scanned and it tells you where your mother and mother's mother, et cetera, came from, uh, generally speaking, okay? Of course, it's not, not you can't pinpoint a, a specific place. But yeah, but this is actually used, so you can, you, you, you can quite distinctly dif uh, differentiate between different types of, uh, of, of mitochondrial DNA, absolutely, yeah. Functionally, question is, are they different functionally? Well, there are people who are, st who are trying to study it. So for example, there are mit mit mitochondrial haplotypes, which are quite common, for example, in the north of uh, Norway, Sweden, and, uh, and Finland. And the idea was, well, are these mitochondria somehow more adaptive to the cold weather or something like that? But this was not actually shown at all. So from the studies that we have now, it looks like all the haplotypes are functionally the same, but, but when we look at the sequence, they're actually different. Yeah. Uh, there were some other questions? No, yeah. Correct, yes. Absolutely. You can have Mendelian inheritance for mitochondrial disease, for some mitochondrial disease, absolutely. Yeah. So again, you can have both parents recessive, they don't have any problems, but you end up with a, with a disease. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is how we can treat mitochondrial diseases, okay? Now, mostly what you find in textbooks now, or, do you have a question? Um, what you find in textbooks now is just like symptomatic therapy, okay? So you give these patients uh, some vitamins because sometimes they help, okay? Uh, but generally there's no causative action. It's, it's not, we, we can't do very much to actually get rid of these, uh, of these mutations. There is one, not so much a treatment method, but maybe more of a prevention method, uh, which is legal in the United Kingdom and maybe some other places as well, but I know of the UK. Um, and this is mitochondrial transplant. And this is done during the um, uh, in vitro fertilization. So you can't actually do it during normal fertilization. But in vitro fertilization, and when there's a risk that a mitochondrial disease might be transmitted, so for example, the mother has some symptoms, maybe not so severe, but some symptoms, or that uh, a damaged mitochondrial DNA was detected, what we can do is, and again, it's not legal in most countries, but in the UK it is, so what we do is we have the egg from the mother who actually wants to have a baby and we take the nucleus out and put it into a different egg from a donor, okay? So we remove the nucleus from that and we put the mother's nucleus into this new egg. And obviously this new egg contains perfectly healthy mitochondria. And then this new mixed egg with a different nucleus and a different cytoplasm is then fertilized with a sperm from the father. So okay. you know how to differentiate between the damaged mitochondria or the damaged DNA inside the nucleus because you can have disease either or this one. Well, this is, this is only for the mitochondrial diseases where the mutation is in the mitochondria. 
Okay? If it's in the nucleus, yeah, there's not much you can do. Okay? I mean, you can select the embryos that will have the recessive trait, for example. But, but this is for mitochondrial diseases, which are actually mutations in mitochondrial DNA. What is interesting about this is that the child that is born out of this has three genetic parents. Okay? So there's the nuclear mother, there's the mitochondrial mother, and there's the father. So the nucleus comes from the mother, okay? But the rest of the cytoplasm comes from a donor, from another mother. So the mitochondria actually come from a different person than is the nuclear mother, okay? And this was something that posed some interesting ethical questions and like who the parents are. It's, 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 it's an interesting thing. But it does actually occur. It, it has been done in the United Kingdom and it's legal there. I'm not sure about other countries. I, I don't think it's legal here, for example, to, to do this transplant. The final potential method for treating mitochondrial diseases uh, would be the method that you all heard about, which is called CRISPR, which is a method for, who's heard of CRISPR? Raise your hand. Really? Okay. CRISPR is a method for targeted editing of genes. Okay, so it's a, it's a very uh, elegant method where we can take part of the DNA and edit it, change the sequence, okay, inside cells or in vitro or whatever. Um, and you could easily see that you could use CRISPR to correct these mutations. Unfortunately, it's very difficult due to the two membranes, and one of them is very poorly permeable, it's very difficult to get these, uh, th this whole machinery for CRISPR into the mitochondrion. So that is not, that doesn't seem to be uh, nowadays possible to actually correct these mutations. Maybe in the nucleus, we might be able to do that, but again, you probably heard about the case last year when it was published that two children were born uh, in China whose genes have been changed using CRISPR. Who's heard of that? Raise your hand. Very few people. Okay, some people. So there was an experiment where basically, of course, without the kid's knowledge because they weren't born yet, they used CRISPR to edit out a receptor from their immune cells. And the stated reason, which to me sounds completely bizarre, was that they wanted to impart uh, um, immunity from HIV infection. Because HIV virus needs this receptor to get into the immune cells. So if you don't have that receptor, you can't get HIV. That was the idea. Of course, it's completely stupid. First of all, there are much, much easier ways to pr protect oneself from HIV, okay? Like using condom, for example, okay? You don't need to, you don't need to change your genetic information for that, okay? But the other, even bigger problem is that nobody really knows what this CCR5 receptor does apart from allowing HIV, HIV to get into the cells. And they had no idea. So maybe it will cause these, these kids to be completely stupid or, or whatever. Actually, there were experiments afterwards were done on mice. So, you know, we have to take it with, with a grain of salt. But in mice, they actually, the muta if you remove this receptor, it really does decrease their intelligence or whatever passes for intelligence in mice. Okay, so they weren't able to run through the labyrinths or something like that, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so you, you can just see that if you have a technology, it doesn't mean that you should just use it because there are just so many pitfalls that, and, and as I said, people have no idea what this, and these kids, I think they've been born now, and who knows what kind of damage they will have because of this stupid, stupid thing. Yeah, I mean, they might never get HIV, fine, but, um, but uh, I think they, they might be in trouble. Maybe not, but, but I think it's an extremely risky thing to do if we don't really understand all the repercussions. All right, any more quick questions? Yes? Could there have been like a safer thing to remove, like some sort of I don't think so, but not in this specific case, I don't think, no. All right, okay, that's all.